Hello, everyone, and thank you for participating in this symposium. Thanks to Mona Biel, Tom Biss, and Brian Flick for inviting me to share some of our work today. I'd first like to acknowledge my current and former students, Lauren Carroll and Rachel Guy, without whom most of this work or many of the photographs I'm showing today wouldn't exist, particularly Rachel, whose dissertation work forms the basis for where we are and where we hope to go next. So today I'm going to share a little bit about our work that is ultimately aimed at forecasting the influence of sea level rise on estuarine fishes and crustaceans and ultimately the food web that depends on them. As this crowd knows well, estuaries and the incredible salt marsh complexes that constitute a major part of those systems are highly productive environments which provide essential habitat for recreational, commercial, and non-game fishes and crustaceans, including refuge, foraging opportunities, and as an important nursery habitat. Understanding the dynamics of habitat use and population fluctuations within estuarine fishes is critical to fisheries management. Changes to small-bodied non-game species or even juvenile game and commercial species are often overlooked by traditional long-term fisheries monitoring programs. Limited resources are understandably focused on managing game species or those with commercial interest. Um, however, small-bodied non-game fish are important forage species and changes to these populations can significantly impact the larger estuarine community. And as we know, estuary habitats may be particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. And what are those potential impacts on the Necton community? Well, various authors have suggested that sea level rise can lead to a direct loss of habitat, trophic cascades as some species respond to those changes more than others, shifts in assemblage, loss of diversity. And as in other systems around the world, these changes can result in a loss of redundancy, leading to reduced resilience to other externalities. As a spatial ecology lab here at UGA, we're particularly interested in how the distribution and abundance of species are likely to change uh, relative to landscape pattern, uh, particularly due to both natural and anthropogenic stressors. This image shows predicted changes using the sea level affecting marshes model version six, based on a one meter sea level rise through 2100. Although there are certainly uncertainties in these models, it is nearly certain that landscape structure will change. For a portion of her dissertation work, Rachel Guy asked these fundamental questions. What are the current patterns and trends in abundance of estuarine nectar? Is that diversity and abundance of dominant species related to landscape structure of the salt marsh complex? And if so, what are the potential impacts of changes to this marsh landscape structure um, due to sea level rise? For this work, Rachel used an eight year record from the juvenile trawl survey conducted throughout four sounds by Georgia DNR's Coastal Resource Division, which occurred monthly from March through November throughout the period, this period of record. I'm going to really gloss over a bunch of Rachel's work to make a few key points today. So apologies to Rachel for only telling a small part of the story. But let's dive right in and look at some annual trends in fish richness and abundance for some of the most dominant species in the trawls. Trends in Atlantic croaker and spot did not show detectable patterns in abundance, but varied widely throughout the sampling period. We did detect a uh, declining trend in species richness and abundance of bay anchovy, white shrimp, and brown shrimp over the sampling period. While these trends were statistically significant, the high variability does raise the question whether these are biologically significant trends. From other results I won't share today, there's little evidence these trends are due to abiotic factors, but relatively weak relationships and high variation overall suggests that overall trends may be part of a larger cycle over a longer time frame. However, if observed declines in common species are real, particularly an important forage species like bay anchovy, further investigation is warranted. 
for some species, we do have that longer record, albeit from a slightly different size class and habitat type. The Coastal Resource Division's Ecological Monitoring Trawl Survey, or EMTS, spans about 35 years now. Here we see catch per unit effort for white shrimp from 1976 to 2016. And you can see two things. First, at least for part of the record, the EMTS data does track the juvenile trawl data uh, to a certain degree. And secondly, as I suggested, it seems that the decline we observed from an eight year record may just be an artifact of where that sampling occurred within a longer term cycle of variation in abundance. For brown shrimp, we see pretty much the same pattern, perhaps an even clearer signal that the recent decline uh, was not in fact reflected in the long-term record. So now let's take a look at what Rachel found with respect to whether landscape metrics were significantly related to fish richness and abundance. We use two abiotic variables we know are related to species occupancy and abundance because of physiological tolerances, etc., salinity and temperature. We also included an indicator variable for sound to account for differences in productivity and other things that might co-vary um, due to being part of the same uh, system. And finally, we calculated seven additional landscape metrics we anticipated would change with sea level rise. Mean values of each variable were then extracted from a 500 meter radius surrounding each trawl location and I won't take time today to discuss any details of the modeling approach, but for those who are interested, we used a model selection approach with a random forest algorithm, selecting the most parsimonious model with the lowest root mean square error. So what did Rachel find? I'll jump right to the take home here for time. And that is that landscape structure was important for describing fish richness and abundance for these species. As you can see here, the proportion of regularly flooded marsh, irregularly flooded marsh, and some metrics having to do with edge density or the proportion of edge to area uh, were as important as salinity and temperature in describing um, richness and abundance of these three species. So we can now recalculate those variables for future time points based on SLAM predictions and forecast how richness and abundance might respond to sea level rise induced landscape change. So again, jumping straight to the summary, this figure shows the potential change in richness and abundance of bay anchovy, croaker, and white shrimp under three sea level rise scenarios. While Atlantic croaker looks to potentially gain some habitat under the most extreme scenario, all other predictions are for a decline in richness or abundance by about two to 37%. So we know that marsh landscape structure is predictive of richness and abundance, and that if sea level rise leads to loss of regularly flooded habitat and lower edge density, we are gonna, we will potentially see declines in species that rely on these habitats for forage and refuge. So as is typical for research, we made some progress but some pretty important questions remain. First, what are the long-term trends in abundance for a broader suite of marsh-affiliated small body fishes? And if we build this record, can we better isolate the influence of environmental gradients over short versus long time scales? And finally, if any of these forecasts have some probability of being true, what is the potential impact on the rest of the food web and the fishery? This of course is a big job, but we hope to keep picking away at this problem and we're currently doing this in two ways. First, my master's student Lauren Carroll hopes to use the EMTS data to explore trends in environmental relationships for a broader suite of species. And Lauren is also working on adapting a food web model from the South Atlantic for use in Georgia estuaries. This mass balanced food web model using the program EcoPath with EcoSim can be used to explore the impacts of changes imposed on one or more components of the food web. Here's a depiction of the South Atlantic Regional Ecopath model with anchovies highlighted in the middle. Um, the green connections link anchovy with their prey and the red connections link anchovies with pisophores that rely in part on them for prey. 
So in a mass balance model like this, we can play games such as reducing anchovies or increasing anchovies by a certain percentage and evaluate the potential responses of their predators and prey throughout the food web. Finally, to really improve our understanding of these environmental relationships and, the, and improve the quality of our forecasting moving forward, we just need more data. So nearly two years ago, Rachel Guy brought several of us together to form an estuarine fish monitoring cooperative with the overall goal to address the need for curated and shared long-term monitoring data for small body estuarine nectin while also providing training opportunities for future coastal scientists. Partners so far include Sapelo Island National Estuarine Research Reserve, Coastal College of, College of Coastal Georgia, uh, UGA, uh, Warnell, Marine Science, and Marine Extension. Pursuant to this goal, we're developing a standardized sampling protocol that pools resources among a network of cooperating institutions to meet both sampling and training needs. Thus, our objectives are to design a shared sampling protocol, combine these data with other fisheries independent data into an accessible online database, and design a training program for future coastal scientists. Incidentally, the scaling up of this network is the basis for our Sea Grant proposal, which we will submit on June 4th. Our research questions for this effort, which undergrad students and interns will be involved in helping us to address along the way, include practical questions related to sampling design and integrating data from different methodologies, to some of the bigger questions we're addressing, such as explanations for the variation in richness and abundance at both short and long timescales. And finally, we hope to evaluate and adapt our experiential learning program to achieve positive training outcomes for our students and interns. If we get this fully launched next year, perhaps one of us can come back and tell you more. In the meantime, if you're interested in learning more about this effort, please get in touch with me or Rachel Guy. With that, I'll uh, leave it with acknowledgments of several of the folks who've been involved in this work over the years and, and some of the partner institutions. Thank you very much.